Let's, uh, let's open in prayer. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this chance to praise you. We, th we thank you for this opportunity to remember your sacrifice by taking communion together. We thank you for a chance to remember that our, that our responsibility, that the example you set us, we're to serve one another. Lord, help us as we talk this morning to, to really realize the depth of a simple thing that has big connotations. Lord, help us to take the simple things seriously. Because sometimes they're the most important. Lord, pierce us today with your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 3, starting at verse 31. And let me tell you before I start reading a little bit of what's happening in Mark. Mark starts by introducing Jesus, and then he goes through a little bit of time explaining Jesus, giving events that help us understand the authority and the character of Jesus as the king. What does he get to do? Who is he? What's his identity? And we went through seven different kinds of authority that Mark outlines from that. And now we've been introduced to the disciples. Jesus called the disciples. We have 12 disciples. And now we're going to start exploring discipleship as a topic. That's what's happening now. So there was the introduction of Jesus and then this explanation about who he is and how that works. And now we've introduced the disciples and we're going to have this explanation about what they're about and, and how this works. What is discipleship? So that's what's happening. And everything that we're going to study for quite a few weeks is going to have to do with discipleship. It's not, it's not accidental. The, the way that these things are pieced together in Mark aren't haphazard or random. It's purposeful. It's all laid out and very organized. And really, this is going to be the first point. So there was a first point with Christ. There was Christ and he is the Lord. And what was the first point? What was those? his authority over truth, his authority over the spiritual realm. And that set up the rest of it. In the same way, this point, as simple as it is, in some ways sets up discipleship. It is one of the main characteristics of discipleship. It comes from this very simple passage. So starting in verse 31, this is what we read. And his, that's Jesus, his mother and his brothers arrived. And standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. And answering them, he said, well, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about on those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my brother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. This is a very complicated message. This is a simple event. It isn't going to take long for me to describe the action here. This isn't one of those things where I'm going to pull out some hidden Old Testament meaning that's going to illuminate the passage in some grand way. That's not happening today. This is a simple action. You probably got most of it figured out already. But let's, let's make sure we work through the items. In verse 31, his mothers and her brothers arrive and they're standing outside. Outside of what? Well, we can find that out if we go look around. For instance, in Luke 8, 19, we find out for certain it's outside the crowd. So there was an enormous crowd. In fact, if we go back a little ways, we find out that Jesus is being mobbed so badly, he's not eating well. He's, he's having a hard time getting enough food. He's probably getting, having a hard time getting rest. As we go through Mark and he retreats away in the boat, it's because he's getting no peace. In fact, if we go back a little ways, in verse 20 and 21 of the same verse, or chapter, it reads this way. And he came home, and the multitude gathered again to such an extent that he could not even eat a meal. And when his own people, own people, you think maybe family counts for own people? I think so. I think so. When his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying he's lost his senses. Jesus, you're going to hurt yourself. 
There's a what? Imagine your child. I'm thinking of my one of my girls, and they're they're doing this thing, and they have become so popular, so loved. They're not eating well. They're not sleeping right. What am I going to do as a dad? March in there and fix her. You young lady need to eat something. I'm going to get you some sleep. Right? Come on, this is family. This is family, acting like family. Jesus is not in the appearance of, the, of his family, taking care of himself properly, and they have come to fix it. This is normal. This sounds really normal to me. This is, sounds like family, especially Jewish family. I, I mean, that was racist, but I don't know. I don't, I don't know if you know why Jewish people, Jewish mamas can be very firm. So that's what's going on here. Why are they here? I don't know that we can say absolutely for sure why they're here, but I reckon that they're trying to, they brought to you some food and they, they wanted to rest. I don't know for certain why his mothers and brothers are here. He doesn't say that exactly, but if we put that together with the previous passage, it seems likely. Worried about him? Thinking to try to talk a little sense into him? What are you doing? You're gonna, you're gonna exhaust yourself? Something like this. And so in verse 32, we have, and the multitude was sitting around him, and they said, your mothers and brothers are outside looking for you. What does this tell us? This crowd was dense, or mom and brothers would have just walked right up, right? Why did someone have to tell him? His, why couldn't he just look over there and see, oh, there's mom and my brothers. Why couldn't he see them? Because the crowd was so vast, he couldn't see the edge clearly enough to tell who was there. That's a pretty big crowd. If Jesus can't just look over there and go, oh, look, there's mom. You think he doesn't know what mom looks like? He can't do it. He can't just go, oh, there's mom. Someone has to tell him, hey, way out there in the edge, where, I mean, when you can't even see, your mom and brothers are out there. This should give us a feel for what kind of crowd. This is massive. Absolutely. No wonder they're worried for him. It's not like he has bodyguards. You know, maybe the 12, maybe that's why I picked fishermen. <laughs> maybe, maybe he needed crowd control, someone to like muscle people back. I don't know. That's what's happening now. And then Jesus has a reaction in verse 33 through 35. He says, who are my brother and my mother? Sort of backwards, my mother and my brothers. And he looked around at those who were just around him, and he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. He states clearly, first of all, that the disciples are his family. That's a statement. We're going to explore the depth of what that means. But he does something even more powerful than make the statement. Now let me see if I can't illustrate to this to you. Suppose you had a friend, and you said to this friend, oh, you're like family to me. Oh, I love you like a brother. I love you like a sister. I love you like my own dad. And this is the sort of stuff that you said. And then, but then when your real family showed up, whatever it was you were doing, it doesn't matter how important it was, it doesn't matter, you dropped it in a second and you went over to spend time with your family. Follow what I'm getting around with that? You see, you could say all you wanted, and you're like a brother to me. But if when your real brother shows up, you drop this guy like a hot coal, and you go see your brother, what did you disprove? He's, He's not. You just proved that my real brother has far more importance to me than you do. So not only does Jesus make the statement, you are family to me, in what he's doing, he proves he means it because he doesn't move. He doesn't budge, he doesn't get out of his seat, he doesn't go, oh, it's mom. You know, and push his way through the crowd to get to her. That's not what happens. He sits there. He proves.
proves that their value is just as high as his own family by keeping a seat and continuing on with exactly what he does. Um, and that's, that's it. That's the understanding of the passage. That's all there is to understand from the action. It's not any more than that. That's what happens. There aren't any more fancy clues to pull out. Um, so what am I going to talk about for the next 15 minutes or so? <laughs> well, well, I see being me, this leads me to more questions. This leads me to more questions. Here's one of my questions. Why is this story in here? Why is this in the Bible? Well, let's, let's think this through. Okay, Jesus is preaching. Every word that comes out of Jesus' mouth is truth. Every word that comes out of Jesus' mouth is the word of God, right? Everything. We don't have a single sentence about what he was preaching about. He said something, and whatever it was, it was awesome. It was great. It, I'd love to hear it. Whatever it was, I wish I knew. It was, it was totally cool. It was Jesus talking. But we don't get any of that. Not one sentence of it. Instead, we get this. You know what that means? This is more important than whatever else, the rest of it, that he said. That whole sermon, whatever he was preaching to the multitude, whatever it was that he was explaining, this moment had greater impact than the rest of it. That's why this is in the Bible and the rest of it isn't. This must be important. Why? Why is this important? Why this detail for us to read about over 2,000 years later? That Jesus' mom and brothers came and he said, no, thank you. I'll stick with these guys. You're my family. Why not? I would suggest that the reason this moment is so valuable is that it completely redefines the term disciple and what it's going to mean in the kingdom of God. Let's think this through. Um, some of you know that uh, the apostle Paul was once named Saul. If you don't know that, I'm telling you now. Uh, the apostle Paul, he wrote much of the New Testament, and his name used to be Saul. And when he was Saul, he had a rabbi. He had a teacher. His name was Gamaliel. We know about Gamaliel from history. We know from his writings. He was a real person. We can study his stuff. We can find his writings. We can read them. Now, if we were to examine the relationship between Saul and Gamaliel, so Gamaliel was the rabbi. Saul would have been the disciple. They would have used the term disciple. It would have been the exact same word that Jesus would have used with his disciples. What do we think and what do we actually know from history? The relationship between the student and the rabbi. The disciple and the rabbi. What was it built on? It was built on a couple of things. It was built on the assumption that the rabbi had great wisdom and the students needed it. Check. That works with Christ. We're, that works. We're the students. He's the rabbi, and the wisdom he has, we need. Check. So far, so good. But you know what? Gamaliel's dedication to the student was marginal. It was the student's dedication to the instructor that was important. See, if the student wasn't dedicated to the instructor, the instructor would eject the student. I'll find a different one that is more dedicated. Imagine, for instance, going to Perth and taking a class in chemistry, even. And the chemistry teacher you would call the rabbi, and then the, you, the student, would be the disciple of chemistry. And the relationship is built on what? Well, the chemistry instructor knows about chemistry. You want to know about that. And as long as you, you put in the time and the dedication and you go to class and you pay the bills to go to the class, 
and you do your homework, you'll learn chemistry. The relationship is built on the commitment of the student, and the teacher has a commitment to teach, but it's certainly not family. It's not, it's not family. You see, up until that point, and really all the rest of the world, the, the relationship between the rabbi and the disciple <coughs> Excuse me. It was valuable. It was great. Things happened. But it wasn't this. Jesus <coughs> changed. Jesus changed that into a relationship that depended on his commitment to them. Someone's going to be one right now. Thank you, Sam. Look at the scenario here. Jesus says, this is Jesus' commitment to the people sitting around them. This isn't their commitment to him. This is his commitment to them. Okay, this is something that Jesus is saying of his own free will to the circle around him, his students. Who are my mother and my brothers? And then in 34, behold my mother and my brothers. Jesus is claiming them as family with the full commitment, the full attention, the full everything that goes with family. So let's think about the difference between family and just student. Think about what you would do. So think of your most intimate family member, whoever that is. The, the family member in your, might be your wife, might be your kids, might be whoever. Think about the family member that, that you feel the most responsibility for in your life. Would you help them at 2 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> Would you empty your bank account for them? Maybe. Would you give them your vital organs? Would you give them a kidney? Your liver? Would you die to rescue them? Whatever love you are capable of, God's love is better, deeper, stronger, and more. Whatever love you're capable of for another human being, your child, your spouse, anyone, whoever it is that you have the most love for, never forget God's love is more. John 3.16 well used, well known verse for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The motive behind Christ going to the cross was love, and that love was based on a love for his family, for people that he cared about, the few people that he considered his mother, his brothers, his family. I think this little story may have been one of Peter's favorite memories. See, the book of Mark is Peter's memories organized and penned by Mark. That's what this is. So this is what Peter would remember. And Peter looked back to this day. Peter looked back to this moment, and he didn't even remember maybe the words of that particular sermon. How many sermons of Jesus did he hear? And even though they were the word of God, he was just a guy. How much did he remember? But he remembered this. He remembered the day that Jesus looked at him in his eyes. And he said, Peter, you're my family. 
And because he was Jesus, because of the way Jesus spoke, because of what came out of Jesus, Peter knew he was telling the truth. Peter knew it was real. Peter knew it was, whoa, that's bizarre. That's crazy. You love me like, you actually love me like a brother. See, the realization that Peter would have had in that moment would have been huge. He isn't just the disciple of a rabbi. He is, has a relationship with this man, this beautiful, perfect, kind, loving man who has claimed him as family. This is emotional. This is personal. This is deep. This is real. This moment is in the Bible because it's the most important thing that happened that day. It was a moment that would transform the way the disciples viewed their relationship with Christ. And it needs to continue to influence, and it does, because what happens later? See, when Mark was written, we didn't have the rest of the New Testament, all of it put together yet. This builds all kinds of things from here. This whole idea of being born again, being in a family, being adopted by God, Jesus being the firstborn of many brothers. There's so many theological things that we take for granted that we said we understand as Christians. But where do they have their heart? Where did they start? Right here. Here. This is where it started when Jesus said, you're my family. Because up until this point, they didn't understand that. Verse 35, he says, My family is whoever does the will of God. Let's be honest. How much have the disciples done so far? Next to nothing. He's not talking much about what they have done. But he is talking about what they will do. You're my family and you will do the will of God. Not so much yet. But you will. And he knows. He wasn't making the commitment based on their past. He was making it based on their future. See, if understanding that we are family with God doesn't fill us with awe and wonder and gratefulness and humility and confidence, then we don't understand either one who Jesus is or we don't understand what family means. If we understand who Jesus is and we understand what family means and we understand that we are members of Jesus' family, that should be a life-changing realization. That should alter the way we walk every day. That should totally change the way we view every moment that we live. If we get it, that Jesus is actually who Jesus is and I'm family with him. That's profound. Simple, but profound. And it's the first foundational concept of discipleship. That to be a disciple of Christ is to be his family. With all the benefits that that includes. If you are family with Jesus, and I am family with Jesus, so here's the next step. I'm, I'm family with Jesus. You are family with Jesus. Then what does that make us? Family. You are family with me. That's what that means. I don't know what your family is like. I can tell you that in my family, our level of commitment has little to do with how much we always like or agree with each other. Because that's family. Right? I don't know about you. I don't always agree or like everyone in my physical family. <clears throat> I'm going to give you an example. Um, I have a sister who's a paraplegic. I talk about her from time to time. She's in a wheelchair. Her name is Christy. Normally when I talk about Christy, <clears throat> I'm using her as this positive example because she is a Christian and her, she lives a very successful Christian life. And, and I'm really proud of her. 
Today, though, I'm going to say some things that I haven't said before, and they're not against her, they're just about our relationship. Sometimes I find her annoying. Like, for real. Sometimes, after we've um, been on the phone for an hour, I'm looking for reasons to not be on the phone for an, anymore. Okay, okay we've, we've talked to another. You know, she and I disagree theologically on a few things. She's a Christian, I'm a Christian. We do not agree on everything. We don't. We have had heated disagreements, as siblings can. Some of you in this room I know have heated disagreements with your siblings. Of course, none of this has anything to do with my concern for her well-being or my willingness to act on her behalf. I'm going to give you an example. Uh, when I go home to America, Christy and I will normally go do things together. We might be in her car. We might be having a spirited discussion. It might be a very spirited discussion. As siblings can have. Do you think... So here, here we are in the middle of our spirited discussion. And we stop to get some lunch. Do you think that because we're having a spirited discussion, I do not go get a wheelchair out of the back of the car? Do you think that I don't, after helping her get in the wheelchair, lift her over this curb that's too big for her to pop over? Do you think that because we're having a spirited discussion that I don't pay for her lunch? Do you think it would keep me from defending her if I thought she was in trouble? The basis of our relationship isn't the perfect alignment of our opinions, or even how much I like her right that second. She is family. I love her. It's not negotiable. It's not iffy. It's an unchangeable fact. She's my sister. A couple things we need to understand as we put together and understand family as it really is in what Jesus just said. You see, in our relationship with God, he's not the one in the wheelchair. I am. He doesn't quit helping me, doesn't give up on me, doesn't lose faith in me, never quits providing for me, even when I am being a jerk face. Because I'm his family. But more importantly to us, not more importantly to God, but more importantly between each other, the question is, is this how we treat each other as family? Is this the way I treat other Christians that I meet? Is this the way we deal with each other in our church? Is this the way we deal with people from other denominations, especially denominations that make our skin edge up because we really don't like that one? If we would treat each other like our most cherished family members, what would it look like different? What would it look like different here? What would it look like worldwide? How would it change the way we think about people who are from a different culture, different color? How would it change our view on missions? If that seems overwhelming, start close. How do we respond when another member of the body has a real need? And here's some hard questions for us. When somebody in our congregation has a need, we hear about it, we know about it, and it's real. Do we hope someone else will volunteer to help them first? So we're off the hook. Or do we perpetually have other demands in our life that are more important and we'd really like to help but we just can't? Because I'm too busy. Is that what you would do for your real family? Is that what you do for your real brother and sister or father or mother? Would you say I'm too busy or would you drop it for them? 
Does your response change based on how much you like the person? Because I think we have a tendency to do that. Does our response change based on what they last did for us? Or how long ago it was that they lasted something for us? How conditional is our love for each other really? God's love for us is completely unconditional. Otherwise, we wouldn't get any of it. If it was not 100% unconditional, we wouldn't get any. And that's exactly what he's asking of us. His service to one another, like what he modeled at the Last Supper when he said, wash each other's feet. Not because they washed your feet last week, but because their feet are dirty. Wash them. See, Jesus made the commitment of family to people who are far from deserving us. And that's our example. And that is the expectation. So the challenge I have for us today is so simple. This is a simple passage, and it is a simple challenge. And really, there's only a couple different points for us to really get our heads on. First, is to understand that to be a disciple means to be part of Christ's family. And if you're trying to figure out this Christianity thing, if you're trying to figure out what it means to be a Christian, or whether you are a Christian, or what you believe, I need you to understand, it isn't whether you keep a set of rules, it isn't whether you have adopted a specific creed, it isn't whether you come to church a certain amount of days out of the year, it's whether or not you're family with Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's it. If you're interested in figuring out how that happens, please come talk to me. It's the coolest thing that can ever happen to you. Come talk to me about how you can be in the family of God because it is fantastic. Amen. But as we live this life out, don't let it drift away from that. Don't let it... We started with... We knew that we had to become God's family, but are we still treating God like family? When's the last time you called? You know, that question. We hold on to the truth that God loves us, that Jesus loves us, that is an unconditional love. And it is the foundation of being his disciple. But in our response to that, we sometimes need to do a lot more work at treating each other like we're family. It's a simple message. It's a simple point. But it, and I've talked about it before. This isn't the first time. What would the impact be to all of that if, if we treated each other like family. And I think we do really well on many, many points. I think we have a lot more to go. I don't think we're perfect yet. I, I acknowledge and I'm grateful for and I love, part of the reason I love this church is because of the way we have been treated like family since we've been here. So please don't feel as if I'm beating us all about the head of the club and saying well, there's no love in this church. That would be true. There is love in this church. But there is still ground to be made. There are steps to be taken. There is further we can go. There is more risk. There is more openness. There is more closeness that we can attain as family together. And the more we move into that and the further we go into the way we treat each other that way, the more our loyalty becomes ironclad the more the world around us will wonder at the love and the commitment and the power of this community together and the way we treat one another. It will be a witness that is undeniable that doesn't even need words. It will powerfully impact the world around us. So in this passage, Jesus defines discipleship in a very simple way, in a way that I think changed Peter's life forever. He said, you're not just a student who has to earn the right to continue sitting in that spot, or maybe I'll replace you with somebody else. 
He said, you're my family. And he meant it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have invited us to be members of your family. And yes, there's worship involved. We worship you and there's praise involved. We praise you. Yes, there's obedience involved. We obey you. Yes, there's all those things involved as well, Lord. But it isn't just that. It isn't just the relationship of a servant. It is the relationship of a son and a daughter. It's the relationship of a child. We are the recipients of an everlasting inheritance. We are the recipients of an incredible birthright. We are the recipients of grace beyond measure. And Lord, we are so thankful that we get to be members of your family. Lord, would you help your family treat each other like family? Would you help your children to treat each other like the brothers and sisters we are? Would you cause us to not treat each other according to how much we agree on paper, but because of our identity, because we simply are related. We are brothers and sisters. It's who we are. Lord, you expect us to love one another and that in that love, that is how the rest of the world would know that we belong to you. That we had love for each other that was unconditional and powerful and real. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to serve each other. And I pray, Lord, that we would build on the foundation that we have now as a church here. And that it would spill out all over the community around us. In Jesus' name we pray.